Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for coming out. Am I speaking to myself? Is anyone here? Is anyone here? Is anyone here? Thanks for getting up early and making it to the first session. Isaiah, you're the first, first one here, it seems. Thanks for coming out. Christy, Larissa, Netflix, Bubs. Netflix, Bubs is on all my videos. Kat, Shamoy, Denzel, Imran, thank you guys for waking up early and joining us here in case my background looks a bit dark i am it, it's night where i am i know it's it's morning where you guys are today we're just going to be doing a poetry q and a thank you guys for waking up and coming out before we start could you just let me know where you guys are coming in from where are you guys coming in from? You can just type, type it in the chat. Where are you guys showing up from? I'm from Jamaica, by the way, but I am doing this live from, from Japan, not from Jamaica. Trinidad and Jamaica represented so far. Good, 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 good. What what time is it in Trinidad? Now is it is it eight a.m. Saint Lucia. That's Masian, Masian. I know it should be eight a.m. in Jamaica at this time. What what time is it in in your country? What time is it where you're joining from? Nine. Okay, so you, you guys are pretty lucky. It's, it's not so bad. It's not so bad for you guys. 9 a.m. Is anyone joining from, from 7 a.m.? If so, I apologize. <laughs> Could you explain how we prepare for the poem essay? Memorizing lines. Uh, we'll be doing the essay writing session tomorrow. So today we're just trying to clear up any any misconceptions, any confusions, answer any questions about the poems. And tomorrow we'll actually go into writing some essays. So tomorrow is going to be a very exciting session. I'll take you guys through a sample essay, step by step, I'll guide you through the whole format. And then and, and then we will actually be doing our own essays. We'll be, we'll be writing our original essays and I'll guide you through that process. So, Edicia, I'll be answering that question tomorrow. We'll be looking at that tomorrow. From the Cayman Islands, it's 8.03. All right, we're going to start proper in about two or three minutes, just giving a few more persons time to, to show up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you guys can take a look at the agenda for the next three days. This is our agenda for the next three days. So today we'll be doing the poetry Q&A and we'll be looking at all 20 points. We'll be spending about five to 10 minutes Per poem, just looking at questions that you guys might have. I'm kind of assuming that you already know the poems well and you have already watched lessons on the poems and so on. Hopefully, you guys have been watching my videos on the poems. I try to be thorough, I try to really comb through every line, but 
I understand that you might watch several videos on a poem, you might discuss a poem with the teachers and you still have questions. So that's what that's that is what today is all about. And tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be doing an essay marathon. We'll be writing at least two essays and I'll be showing you a sample essay. By the way, I have some videos out where I, I show you at least three sample essays. So you have to check those out before tomorrow's lesson because tomorrow we're going to hit the ground running. And on Wednesday, we'll be doing the dreaded paper one marathon. The English B paper one is, is tough. It's extremely, extremely tough. I've got my hands on three paper ones. We'll be doing those on on wednesday maybe i'll i'll get my hands on another one before then if so then we might do more than three so we'll be looking at techniques to to uh, to you know and techniques in answering those paper one questions and we'll be actually solving those um, past papers at least three past papers so for these three sessions we'll be covering internet has more so we'll have to link up because maybe we can we can do even more than three papers. So it's it's ten oh seven p.m. for me. Uh, I'll try to go until midnight my time. So we'll we'll be doing a two hour session basically. Maybe we'll go a bit longer. Or maybe we'll end a little before two hours. Just depending on on what's on what's happening, depending on how we are feeling and on how much progress we're able to make. Yeah. So I think we can go ahead and get started. I think we have about 40 persons, 42 persons here. So we're just gonna, we're not gonna wait any longer on, on the latecomers. More persons might be coming in, but we'll actually get started. Uh, by the way, at some, sir, would, would you only be doing poetry? Ah, uh, I I'm I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'll I'll be focusing on just poetry and paper one for these sessions. I I'm not as um, familiar. I'm not as I'm not an expert on the the prose or or drama sections. I I haven't even read through those texts. So I will not be covering those. I think there are other resources you can find on YouTube. Uh, so hopefully you can get some good content on, on those two areas. But for now, I'm just trying to cover the poetry 100% because uh, the, the poetry, for one, I, I'm very much interested in, in, the po in the poems. And two, there are all of 20 poems and the poems are actually like high level stuff so i want to get into the poems so the poems can feel less cryptic less confusing and you know ah oh oh really really thank you thank you very much uh and uh, I, I can't pronounce that name miss charles <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead we're doing the poetry q and a I have a list of poems. I have the list. Uh, let's see. We're just going to go in the order. By the way, for those of you who missed the Poetry Talk sessions, uh, we've had two Zoom, two Zoom meetings over the past few weeks. This is Poetry Talk 2. We had Poetry Talk 1 where... Um, teachers and students from across the, the Caribbean met and discussed some of the poems. Uh, the last Zoom meeting I did, in about 15 seconds, or about 15 seconds after actually starting the meeting, we reached the limit of 100 participants because my Zoom account has a limit of 100. So I, I'm not sure how many other persons were trying to join and couldn't join because they had reached the limit. So I decided to do a live for the remaining sessions just so more than 100 persons can join. If the interest is there, I know it's early morning and some students have to be at school. Most teachers have to be at school. But I know some of you guys are on study break. Uh, sir, is this 
um, going to be posted on YouTube. I'm I am not really sure. I'm not sure. Hopefully, there are some strange uh, copyright issues with some of the poems, some of the texts, even for the paper ones, some of the passages. So joining the live is really the only <laughs> the only safe way to to be a part of, of, of the session. Because after this, I'm not sure if any of the videos or if all the videos will be able to live on YouTube after the live is done. Yeah, so it's it's a little iffy. But I, I think where the poems are concerned, you guys shouldn't be too worried. I, I have released a full length lesson on each poem. So, and there are at least maybe two or three more YouTube channels where teachers present lessons on the poems. So you guys have a lot of uh, a lot of resources. As for the prose and drama, maybe the resources aren't so plentiful, but the, the poems are the roughest. So I think that's why most teachers focus on building content around the poems. Anyway, it's 10, 12, so we should get started. Uh, let me. Let me full screen. All right, so you guys should be able to see God's grandeur. I have uh, all 20 points in this uh, PowerPoint. We'll just be going through each poem and we'll be spending no more than 10 minutes on each poem. I'm assuming that you already know the poems 95%. We're just gonna be dealing with that, that 5% right now at five percent so if you have any questions even after having watched you know analysis videos after having studied the poems maybe there are still a couple of lines that are confusing a few things on iron out a few devices you haven't quite grasped we need to get the poems ironed out before tomorrow because tomorrow we'll be writing essays on the poems so that's why we're doing it in this order the poetry q a and then the the, the essay writing session. So we have we have God's grandeur to begin. And if there are no questions on the poem, we'll just move on to the next one, no problem. But if we have any questions or concerns about God's grandeur, now is the time. Post the questions in the chat. I'll do my best to respond. And other... You know, anyone can really answer, can really answer the questions that are that are being asked. But I'll do my best to give my my personal responses. So we're on God's grandeur. This is a, I think, a fairly straightforward poem. Yeah, this poem speaks about the the greatness of God, the, the grandeur of of God and His how he you know, shows his power through nature and how nature is immortal despite how we treat it. So I'm waiting for some questions on God's grandeur. Okay, life with Navi, Navi, Navi. What are the themes present in this poem and evidence? Okay, so one of the themes in this poem is, oh, let me see if I can type while I, while I speak, uh, man versus nature. That is perhaps one of the most one of the most prominent the uh, themes in this poem: man versus nature. We see in stanza one that nature is yes, man versus yes, nature. Of course, is a broad theme as Netflix Bob's mentions. But man versus nature is like a main sub-theme under that grand theme of nature. We see that mankind is trying to, you know, ruin nature based on how we abuse nature, based on pollution, stuff like that. In the second stanza, we see lots of evidence of that. Uh, in the first stanza, rather, we see generations have trod, have trod, have trod. All is seared with trade. Trade here talking about, you know, commerce, e e our economic uh, ventures and how it affects nature. 
we see that nature is blared, smeared with toil. You know, mankind has been wrecking nature, or so we think. But in the second stanza, we see that nature is still fresh. Nature is still, is still, is still up and running. Nature is never spent. Why? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with our bright wings. So God is really protecting nature. And through God, nature is immortal. So we see man versus nature, and we see God uh, shining through nature as themes. Uh, so what are the devices in this poem? Well, imagery might be the main device or one of the main devices. We see in stanza one, the nature is compared kind of to a fire. It will flame out. We see that imagery of the flame because nature is explosive. Nature is great. Nature is expansive, just like a fire. And we see that that imagery of richness with the ooze, like the ooze of oil crushed. Uh, we, we also see imagery in like the shining from shook foil. There are some metaphors as well. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. In that, in that metaphor, nature is basically compared to an electric current, or, or God is like the electric current through which um, that, that powers nature. We see some similes. It will flame out like the shining from shook foil. Yeah, so if you if you if you watch my lesson on on God's grandeur, you know, I'll I'll You'll see where I talk about the metaphor, similes, and imagery. Those are the three main devices here. All right, trying to keep up with the trying to keep up with the questions here. So, could we say that there's a simile? Yeah, there is at least one simile. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. When you shake foil paper, you see that that glint, that shining, that that uh, reflection of light. That is how nature will shine out. So that's a simile. We see the comparison using like. Yeah. Is there any other, is there another simile? I'm not, I, I don't think so. Uh, is onomatopoeia a valid device? Yes, it is. Where do we see onomatopoeia in this poem, though? I'm not sure there's onomatopoeia in this poem. I might, I might double check for onomatopoeia. Uh, what are some poems that can be used with God's grandeur? Uh, what are some poems that can be used with God's grandeur in an essay? Uh, composed upon Westminster Bridge might be the closest poem. Both of those poems deal with nature, deal with man versus nature. Basically, any other nature poems can be coupled with God's grandeur. Also, any other poems that talk about God or religion, can be coupled with, with God's grandeur as well. Is symbolism a good device? <laughs> I'm not sure what that question means. <laughs> Is it, what, what do you mean by a good device? It's definitely a valid device. It's a real device. Uh, let's see. I know that uh, Netflix Bubs is, is, is saying, yeah, yeah, religion is definitely a theme here, but what is the evidence? Well, it's not necessarily religion, but it's more God, you know, God's power through nature. Basically, the second stanza is very clear. In the last couple of lines, we see that the Holy Ghost is mentioned as like the keeper of nature. So God is mentioned there. In the last line, God is compared to like a hen that is keeping the earth warm, that is really keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. uh, so a stone's throw, a stone's throw is definitely one of the heavier religion poems, but I'm not sure what questions would give you much opportunity to compare a stone's throw with this poem. If, if a question asks you to, to talk about, um, the impact of God or religion, any, anything to do with God or religion. If the question is linking, is asking you to find two poems that link that theme, then yes, a stone's throw could be used. We see how religion is used or depicted in a stone's throw. It's, you can say it's used in a negative, in a negative sense because you know the men abuse their power 
and try to you know, do some devious things to, to that woman. Whereas in God's grandeur, religion is, or God is, is painted in a more positive light. Uh, let's see, have I missed? I'm just touching on, on some of the questions because we'll be breezing through the poems basically. And some of these questions I'm answering, I, I actually answered these in, in, in my analysis videos. So guys, guys, I, I'm hoping you have watched those videos. Uh, let's see, what have I missed? Sir, what do, what does line, what is meant by ooze of oil? Line four, it gathers from lines, lines three and four, it gathers to greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. So nature is most powerful when it, when it is unified. We know that nature can gather itself. For example, if water gathers itself, gathers itself we can have a, a river, we can have a sea, we can have a flood. If sand gathers itself, we can have a desert. So nature can, can gather itself, can meet up on itself. And that element of nature is very rich. Just like when you crush oil, for example, when you're making olive oil, you, you crush the, the, the olives and that oil is oozing. It's a rich oil, a very expensive oil, a very... Um, aromatic, a very flavorful, a very, a very rich oil. So just as how oil can be rich, nature is is rich. So that is the comparison there. The, the ooze of oil crushed. And ooze, someone mentioned onomatopoeia earlier. Oozed can be considered kind of uh, onomatopoeic language. All right. Is main device in this poem is imagery. That's right. The main device in this poem, I would say is imagery. Mm. Okay. I'm not seeing any new questions on this poem. So do we move along? Do we move along? Do we move along? Do we move along? The next poem should be composed upon Westminster Bridge. Very interesting poem. We have a sonnet, sonnet here. We have someone standing on a bridge admiring London in the early morning. And he, he's feeling so calm. He's deeply impacted by, by the nature here. He, he sees infrastructure, the city, meeting with nature, and there is this relationship between man and nature. Similarly, um, well, we have seen that relationship in the previous poem. So do we have any questions about composed upon Westminster Bridge? Any confusion about this poem? Any issues? Any difficulties? Composed upon Westminster Bridge? Composed upon Westminster Bridge, no questions. Going once. We are not doing this poem, never heard of it. Really? Are we not doing composed upon Westminster Bridge? Sonnet composed upon Westminster Bridge? First of all, we, we are doing this poem, right? We are doing this poem. We are. Yes, I think I think we are. Uh, the, the title is sometimes shortened. So maybe that's the confusion. But yeah, it is on the syllabus. It's, it's one of the easier poems. It's definitely one of the main nature poems. Okay, someone asked, what is the main theme? Uh, just as with God's grandeur, I'd say that the main theme here is 
man man versus nature man versus nature or uh, infrastructure in in conflict or in contact with nature so this is another nature poem I wouldn't say <laughs> Ayodel is lying. No, maybe it was just a mistake. Is industrialization is industrialization a theme? Sorry, guys, I might be tripping over my words. It's <laughs> it's after ten p.m. <laughs> uh, definitely, industrialization is a theme in this poem. We see the industrialization in contrast to the nature, basically. In the analysis video, in the in my lesson on this poem. I go a lot into how nature interacts with, with the city. So that's basically what's happening here. Looking at the first couple of lines, uh, uh, this question is not specific to this poem, but what if I don't remember the author? Ah, it's, it's tough because you, you guys have 20 poems, that's 20 authors and 20 titles, but do your best do your best to remember the authors. Find some way to remember the authors because it really adds more credibility to your essay when you can mention the author's name. And when you're doing, when you're writing the essay, you're going to be mentioning the poems several times. In almost in every paragraph, you're going to be mentioning the title of a poem or two poems. So if in no case you're able to state who wrote the poem it might seem as if you're, you're, you're just guessing your way through the essay. So it would be good if you can remember not only the author's name, you know, first and last names, but also some actual lines from, from the poems. Uh, nature and places are themes in this poem, definitely. We see, we see some places, for example, ships, towers, domes, and theaters and temples. And all of these places are basically symbolic. They represent different aspects of human life. You know, ships may represent uh, travel, uh, domes, you know, towers, theaters. Based on what these buildings are connected to, they might represent different aspects of, of human life. And we see all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. So the smokeless here suggests that when people wake up, when the city becomes active, there will be smoke, in other words, pollution, noise, you know, humans interfering with nature. So it's almost as if humans are getting in the way and making nature dirty. But there's also a kind of unity or teamwork between the, the infrastructure and the nature, because we, we see that in line four, the city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. The city is wearing the beauty of the morning. So we can say there's a conflict between man and nature. We can also say there's a harmony between man and nature, based on how you want to interpret the poem. Can God's grandeur be compared to this poem? Certainly. Certainly. What is the mood of the poem? That's a very good question. What is the mood of the poem? How does this poem make you feel? Uh, the mood of the poem might be uh, reflective, wistful, uh, contem contemplative. Uh, we, see a, we see a mood of, uh, or perhaps we could say a tone of, of admiration. Yeah, this, this man is admiring nature. There, there's a mood of calm in the, the first few lines. And then there's a mood of, um, how would I put it? Almost a wistful or wishful wishfulness in the last couple of lines when the speaker is just wishing that this could be the scenery all day long, just wishing that this was a, a permanent scene. But the speaker knows that in a couple of minutes, this the city is going to wake up and there's going to be noise and pollution and all that. What is the main device used? Uh, there, there is contrast, definitely. Uh, there is definitely lots, lots of imagery. And we have lots of personification as well. 
Earth has not anything to show more fear. Earth is showing something, which means that's personification. Ustav, thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. The city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. So the city is wearing the beauty of the morning. That's more personification. And uh, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. We see some imagery there. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor. More personification. Uh, and we see some hyperbole. We see some very... Never did sun more beautifully steep as if this is like the 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 most beautiful the sun has ever been we see never have i felt a calm so deep so this might be some hyperbole and we see coffee saying the mood of the poem could be could be deep compassion and disappointment hmm. deep compassion compassion there, there is some disappointment, I'd say, in the last, in the last couple of lines. As for compassion, you would have to explain a bit more how how compassion would would really be tied into this. Ah, this is an excellent question from Netflix. Uh, when you are explaining a point, do you ever bring up a poet's biography? Hmm, this is this is tricky. You, your focus, your main evidence should always be from the text, from the lines of the poem. However, you can bring up something about the about the point, but I would say do not dwell on the biographical aspect. Dwell on the dwell on the the content of the text. Dwell on the lines within the poem. But of course, you can show that you know who the poet is. For example, when when you look at Martin Carter's "This Is the Dark Time I Love," when you look at uh, Dennis Brutus's "This It Is the Constant Image of Your Face," then it's good to bring up you know who the poet is and the, the context in which the poem is written, because for some poems, the context of the poem, the right, the poet, and the poet's biography can can really shed some light. Um, on, on what the poem means. So you can bring it up, but I would say focus mostly on the, the lines of the poem. Can you, can you use allusion as a device to describe the poet's biography? Hmm. What does this question mean? Uh, if you if you are describing a poet's biography, if you are men mentioning things about the poet's real life, then it wouldn't wouldn't re really be an allusion. Allusion would be if within the poem itself, um, there are references to persons or places or other stories. But if you are mentioning things about the poet, you know who the poet is, maybe what time they are from. That wouldn't be illusion. I'm not sure if I'm understanding that question. Uh, can we do West Indies USA next? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll just be going in the order that I have on, on, on the PowerPoint here. I think I ordered the poems by theme, kind of. So we might be doing the nature poems first. Uh, Sir, what tips can you give us to actually remember the author's name? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lakisha. By the way, Lakisha, thanks for coming out. Lakisha was one of the students who really suggested that I do a live session. And here I am doing three live sessions. So partly in thanks to Lakisha. Um, I'm sorry, but the only thing you can do is just swat the names, just remember the names. The more you read the poems, the more you study the poems, the more you will you will be able to connect the poems to the poet. And just as though you, you might have 30 friends and you know the names of all 30 friends, you just have to make the poets your friends in that try to learn one or two things about the poets themselves, and then maybe you'll be able to remember the names. 
But to be honest, it's it's not going to be easy remembering 20, 20 names and 20 titles. It's not easy, but if you can remember the names, it would really be more impressive you know, when you're writing your essay. Okay, uh, coffee is going back to God's grandeur because the poet shows God's never-ending grace and bounty. Ah, that is the compassion. Oh, so you were referring to God's grandeur, right? Are you talking about God's grandeur or composed upon Westminster Bridge? I'm not sure. Uh, what high school do you attend? I'm not sure if this question is for me. <laughs> I do not attend high school if that question is for me. Uh, all right, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing any more questions on this poem. Do we move on to the next poem? By the way, guys, we I am not doing line by line analyses. I'm not doing lessons on the poems. No. I'm just trying to tackle one or two questions that you might have. Why am I not doing lessons on the poems? No. One, that would take 10 hours. And two, I, I've already published a lesson on each poem. So if you want like all the nitty gritty details on the poems, then watch the videos, guys. I'm I'm just answering questions that you might have, you know, because you might watch a video and you might still be confused about a few things. So that's what I'm tackling right now. Sir, what about those long, boring poems? Yeah, it, it is hard to remember <laughs> the names of the poets when the poems are not interesting to you, but you just have to try, you just have to. And it's difficult to remember lines also from the poems, but we just have to do our best. We just have to read the poems and dig into the poems, discuss the poems, watch videos on the poems, read analyses on the poems, talk to your classmates about the poems, and then some things are going to stick over time. And by the way, an another good way to remember a lot about the poems is to just do some practice essays on the poems. Uh, it it's not so difficult to find past paper questions for the paper too. And even if you've exhausted all of the past paper questions, just make up questions and practice writing essays on them. And then you'll find yourself having to quote lines from the poems. What if the line is related to the author? Well, you should not assume, Netflix, that the line is related to the author. You should instead take the line as being related to the persona, to the speaker. So there's a difference between the poet and the author. The author might write a poem. It might be about themselves, but it might not be. We cannot assume that the poem is about the author. Instead, we should um, analyze the poem as if it is about the speaker, and as if the speaker is different from the, from the author, from the poet. Yes. Mm. Sorry, uh, why why do you think CXC wanted us to remember 20, poem, 20 points? <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. Your guess is as good as mine. I I don't know why CSEC thinks uh, we we should be able to remember. <laughs> 20 poems plus what? 10 stories plus, you know, so many texts. But we just have to do what we have to do. All right, let, let's jump to another poem because I think no more questions are, are coming in on, on this poem. Orchids. Do we have any questions on orchids? Orchids, orchids, orchids. Sir, uh, what if I remember one out of the two poet's names? Should I still go ahead and state the poem? Uh, the only advice I can give you is to just not get in, in that situation. <laughs> uh, e all right. The only compromise you should, you should make, if absolutely necessary, is to just work with the poet's last name. 
If you can't remember first and last names, you should at least be able to remember the last name. Last name alone is not too bad. But not remembering the poet's name at all is worst, worst case scenario. Of course, still write the essay. <laughs> if, if you can't remember any of the poet's names, you still have to write the essay. But knowing at least the last name would be, would be good. Uh, please make the distinction between the speaker and the persona. Okay, this is actually an excellent question, an excellent point. The speaker of the poem is the voice of the poem. Whoever is speaking is the speaker. For example, in Orchids, the person who is saying, I leave this house, box pieces of the five-week life I've gathered, um, this person is the speaker. This person is also the persona. So a poem, might, a poem usually has one speaker because usually one person is speaking. But the personae are really like the main characters in the poem. For example, if we jump, let's just jump down to mirror. In mirror, the, the woman in the poem is, is a persona because the woman in the poem is an important character. But the woman is not the speaker because she is not the one speaking. I am silver and exact. Who is speaking? The mirror is speaking, not the woman. So the mirror is the speaker, but you can say that the woman is a persona. Yeah, so the speaker is the one whose voice we're hearing. But the persona can basically be anybody in the poem, any important character in the poem. All right, I hope that cleared it up. Uh, what is the attitude of the poet? And I guess we're looking at, at orchids now. We're at orchids. What is the attitude? I leave this house box pieces of the five-week life I've gathered. One thing is left. Uh, in the first couple of stanzas, we see the, the speaker is talking about how they're about to move from one house to the next. And they get to the, to the orchids. I think the attitude is, uh, the, the speaker seems to be quite, quite reflective in, in the, Coming to the second half of the poem. I leave this house. Yeah, I might get back to attitude to, to give you a more, more accurate answer. Mm. Uh, what, what poems can be compared with orchids? Well, There is, there is nature in this poem because we have the orchids being a main symbol. The orchids are really a symbol in the poem. So we could compare it to, to other nature poems. Um, we also see a character who is dealing with perhaps uh, some, some kind of internal struggle, perhaps change. Um, we see a person kind of figure, figuring themselves out to see identity. So poems that deal with identity, such as um, all high deal with identity, even uh, the woman speaks. Uh, yeah, so, so basically any poem that shares a major theme with orchids can be compared to orchids. It, it just depends on what essay, on, on what the essays look like, what the essay questions might look like. Uh, what poem, can you give a, a summary of the poem? Ah, I, I don't really want to start doing summaries because I, I have lessons on these poems out, but maybe just for this poem, in stanza one, I'll just go stanza by stanza. In stanza one, we see that the speaker is packing up things, in, in stanzas one and two, packing up some things, to leave their house and move on to somewhere else. I leave this house, box pieces of the five-week life I've gathered. 
So maybe the person lived in this house for only five weeks. So maybe they're moving about, not, not a very stable life, kind of a nomadic lifestyle. And we can actually see some, some cool metaphors here. The, the boxes that are scattered about the house, imagine you're packing up to leave, you're going to have some boxes into which you're packing things. But these boxes represent the person's life. The person's life is kind of in pieces. They're kind of trying to figure themselves out, maybe piece their lives together, maybe recover from a relationship. A number of things could be happening here. And in, the, in stanza two, I'll send them on to fill spaces in my future life. So the person is basically trying to, to have a more uh, consistent, a more whole future. So there are spaces in this person's life, voids, gaps. But then the person sees that one thing is left, a spray of orchids. So the speaker, for the rest of the poem, pays attention to the orchids. In stanza four, the orchids are said to have no fragrance. But the orchids have a purple heart, and the speaker kind of sees some great value in the orchids' purple heart. So even though the orchids seem to be kind of useless, kind of just leftover stuff to be thrown away, the speaker realizes that hmm, these orchids are actually quite valuable. They're, they're quite resilient. They have survived all this time. And basically the speaker looking into the orchids is like, it's like she's looking into a mirror. She's saying, wow, I am just as resilient. I can survive. I can thrive. I can recover just as these orchids have. So it's like the orchids are inspiring the speaker to, to move on, to, 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 to gather their life, to, 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 to be resilient. Yeah, basically. Uh, Lakisha says, I think she's reflecting on a past love. Yeah, that, that could be it. That could be it. Uh, Coffee says, my teacher talks about the leaf of life. The leaf of life. <laughs> the leaf of life. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a leaf of life here, but I guess there might be a connection that I'm missing. But the poem definitely talks about orchids. I'm not sure if leaf of life is, is similar to orchids. Yeah, I'm not sure. Survival. Uh, Netflix. Survival is a theme. Yeah, survival is definitely a theme in this poem because the speaker is basically, just as the orchids have survived, the speaker is surviving whatever difficult time um, they have gone through or they are going through now. So survival is definitely a theme. What other poems talk about survival? Oh, so many poems. Dreaming Black Boy, uh, A Stone's Throw, Old Hag, yeah. Survival poems. Uh, I think she's reflecting on a past love. Oh, okay. Uh, did the poet write the poem in a very broken up structure? Yes, definitely, Deandra. The when we look at the poems, not just this poem, but all the poems, it's it's good to pay attention to the poem's structure delineation, how the words are arranged, how the stanzas are arranged, and look at how this might reflect the meaning. So in this poem, we see some fragmentation, some, some breakage. Look at how we have a short line, a long line. Look at how the stanzas are broken up in, into small pieces, very short stanzas. And this reflects how, how disjointed, how broken up the speaker's life is basically. So that's a very good point. Is hope a theme? Definitely we see, we see hope, renewal, rebirth. These are themes that come out in orchids because just as the orchids have survived being, being neglected, maybe the speaker has survived being neglected. The speaker can find hope in the orchids, basically. Uh, but the persona said that the person who gives the flowers always, yeah, that's that's my thought as well, Imani. Um, the this this could be taken in two ways. The person who gave the speaker the flowers, 
gives everyone flowers. So it's nothing special. If I give everybody a flower, then a flower from me is nothing special. It's nothing great. It's it's a very common thing. And that is one of the points that makes the orchids mm, kind of useless in the poem. The orchids are, are, are seen as something that can be thrown away, you know, in, in the in the at, at first anyway. But Imani, imagine if you have a, a significant other, a, a lover who gives you flowers, but they also have, you know, maybe this lover is cheating on you. So they're giving many people flowers. So it, it could go back to Lakeisha's uh, point of like a broken relationship. Because this person who makes a ritual of giving people flowers, imagine if they're giving, they give their girlfriend a flower, but they have 10 other girlfriends who they're also giving flowers. So you could look at it in that way as well. Yeah. Uh, mm. All right. Am I am I missing? I'm missing any 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 questions here? Uh, it is a it is a problem. Is it a problem or just a choice to leave? Stacy, and could you elaborate on this on this uh, comment? It may not be special, but in line eight, it may be like a tradition, two, four, six. Well, when it says make a ritual of flower giving, it just means this person gives many people flowers on the regular, on a regular basis. So I don't think it's it's a tradition in the sense of like an actual ritual. Uh, it, it just means it's kind of a, just an interesting way to say this person gives people flowers all the time. Okay, we have Michelle. What I find strange is why the woman had so many boxes having lived in a house for only five weeks. Was she, yeah, this is an interesting point. Was she expecting to be there longer? It could be that all of these boxes just represent this person dragging along their past, their past life, past problems, past experiences. And so even though she's trying to move from one stage in life to the next, moving from one house to the next could mean moving from one stage in life to the next, you know, from one relationship to the next, from one, from one level to the next. But imagine you're trying to move on in life, but you're taking all this baggage. So all of these boxes just represent the different pieces of the person's life that she's trying to, trying to take with her as she moves. Yeah. So yeah, you, you live in a house of five weeks, you have a hundred boxes. That's pretty strange. It means you're hoarding. You, you can't let go. You can't let go of the past. That might be the meaning there. Uh, Lakeisha, I think the poem, I think the best poem to compare this, uh, it is the concept. Well, if you if you look at the romantic side of things, you could you could make a comparison. With it is the constant image of your face, but I, I'm not sure if you're going to be lucky enough to get an essay question that will make that comparison uh, viable. It's it's a possible comparison, but it's not an essay I would like to write. <laughs> we could put it that way. It's not an essay I would like to write. And uh, some persons are asking Lakeisha to elaborate on that comparison. So Lakeisha, in the chat, elaborate on how you how you would compare these two points. Can it be compared to mirror? Certainly. We have um, identity and self-acceptance as two themes that connect uh, orchids to mirror. On the flip side, in mirror, the speaker does not accept, not, not the speaker, the persona does not accept herself. In this poem, we can see that the speaker eventually uh, accepts herself and, you know, is trying to be herself and just move on in a positive way. In Mirror, we have the opposite happening, but there's definitely a connection. We see that like a contrasting connection. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome to those just joining in. Uh, ta -ta -ta. All right, I'm searching for some new questions and orchids. If there are no more questions, then why don't we move to the next point? By the way, guys, for those just joining, I, I am not doing a full length analysis on each point. I'm just trying to tackle a couple of a couple of questions on each point because there are videos on the channel where you can watch the analysis videos. You might hear me say this a couple of times because you know we have new students joining. Also, I don't want to spend the time answering questions that I have already answered in those videos. What device is used in orchids? For example, this question. <laughs> uh we see we see some metaphors symbolism might be the main device because we have the orchids which symbolize the speaker actually you could consider it an extended metaphor if, if you want to and um this whole idea of the speaker moving from one house to the next is, is it's a metaphor it's metaphoric uh, metaphorical language so metaphor is also uh, a significant device Mm. yeah so metaphor symbolism might be the main devices there are other devices that you can see in the analysis videos but those might be the main devices uh, so that would show the differences in the attitudes yeah uh so many of, in so many of the essay uh, prompts you will be able to show differences in attitudes uh, when it comes to different personae. So comparing orchids to, to it to mirror, you could definitely show some differences in, in attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, anything else on orchids? Why don't we move on to, by the way, guys, uh, let me just let me just tell you guys. All right, at, at the end, I'll, I'll I'll tell you more about what we'll be doing tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, how many of you guys are actually joining from a from a computer where you will be able to type tomorrow? Are you joining from a phone or from a computer? Because tomorrow I want us to do some 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 serious essay work. And handwriting is, is fine, but I want to be able to see what you guys are doing. So typing would be, would be easier for that. Anyway, we'll talk more about that at the end of this session. Laptop, computer. Good. I like these answers. I like these answers. So tomorrow, get ready to type like 100 words per minute. We're going to be doing a lot of essay work. By the way, have you guys watched the essay writing videos that I've uploaded the last couple of days or weeks I've uploaded some essay writing videos. Yeah, I hope you guys are, are really paying attention to, to those videos. Anyhow, let's jump to bird shooting season. Bird shooting season. Bird shooting season. Uh, we'll complete watching today. Okay, sounds good. Bird shooting season. Another easy poem. We see the men and women preparing for the bird shooting season. Basically, we see that the men are preparing the guns and having fun drinking rum while the women are really doing all of the hard work. So, do we have any questions about bird shooting season? Well, Deandra, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Glad you've made it, you finally made it. Bird shooting season, is everything okay with this poem? Was my video on this poem clear? By the way, we discussed some of these points in the Zoom meetings, but I know not all of you guys were in those meetings. So I'm seeing some of the same questions that we would have. What points can this 
be compared to bird shooting season? I would say that gender might be one of the main themes in this poem, gender relations. So you could compare this poem to A Stone's Throw, talking about men versus women. We definitely see the gender dynamics in A Stone's Throw. We see that the men have have all the power, basically. And here it's not all that different. It's 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 more it's more subtle. There is not as much violence and and so on, but it's definitely a gender poem. Can it be compared to a stone's throw? Definitely. Yeah, women in society and you know, gender roles. We see that the, the women are basically stuck in the kitchen preparing the food, which is like a very old time traditional gender role while the men get to go out and hunt. Yeah. Mm. Masculinity versus femininity. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Any questions about what's happening in the poem or about the devices? Are there any difficult lines in the poem? Uh Miss Griffiths, Miss Yeah, Miss Griffiths. Uh the woman speaks to the man who has employed her son. That's that's another poem that touches on on gender. So definitely we can compare um, the woman speaks with bird shooting season or with a stone's throw, because all of these poems kind of deal with a, um, a power imbalance between men and women. In The Woman Speaks, we see that the employer, who is a man, kind of has power over the woman. The woman's son kind of has power over her as well because she's choosing, he's choosing to you know, go against basically her, her, her upbringing and her, her goals and dreams for him. So certainly we could compare it to The Woman Speaks. So in these poems, we see gender, but we also see power and powerlessness. These two themes are connected. Gender connected with power and powerlessness. Can Caribbean culture be a theme? Um, well, I suppose um, some... And as a question might come up that asks you to to look at how how Caribbean culture is explored in two points. So yeah, culture is definitely a theme. Places, uh, Caribbean culture, basically any idea that can run through a point is a theme, basically, at this level. Uh, Deandra is saying, I do not understand the meaning behind line sixteen to seventeen. Okay, let's find sixteen to seventeen. One, two, three, four. Okay, so the last two lines. <laughs> Why didn't you just say the last two lines? <laughs> uh, little girls whispering, flag, fly birds fly. Okay, so I think the entire poem is um, the whole bird shooting thing. In my opinion, is is an extended metaphor. It's a symbol where the men are going bird hunting, but I think the birds in the poem are really the women being hunted. So the bird shooting is really the men, um, the men overpowering the women, having power over the women. That's what I think the bird shooting represents. And so the little girls at the end are saying, "Fly, birds, fly." The birds, the girls are, you know, kind of soft and, and gentle. They don't want to see the birds get hurt. Maybe the little boys would, would more want to see the birds get shot. But imagine these little girls; they just want the birds, the cute little birds, to be to be okay. And also, if you want to look deeply into it, um, the flag, birds fly, might be like the girls kind of hoping that, you know, eventually the men uh, or, or the women kind of escape this, this box that they're placed in by the men. Or not necessarily by the men, but by society, by the whole gender role business. Uh, and... 
Yeah, Corey says is is going straight to the point that that I was going to touch on. It's showing the, the the cycle of of the gender roles. So if you look at the last stanza, we stand there quietly on the doorstep, shivering. Little boys, what are the little boys longing to do? They're longing to grow up to be just like the men, bird hunters. What are the little girls doing? They're there, kind of just whispering. The whispering kind of suggests that, that same powerlessness, you know, not really having a voice. So basically. In, in 20 years, these boys are going to take the place of the men hunting the birds, and these girls are going to take the place of the women being hunted or stuck in the kitchen preparing food. So that's what I think is, is happening. And on, on the literal level, as Imani is saying, the girls just um, don't want the birds to be harmed. Yeah. Yeah, the women don't have a voice, as Jamaica is saying. So the whispering kind of suggests that voicelessness, that powerlessness. Yeah. By the way, guys, I think I've, I've, I've said most of these things in, <laughs> in my analysis videos. So the secret is out. Most of you have not watched that video. <laughs> uh, are all these points? Yes, all of these points are on my channel, Michelle. I have an in-depth video. Some videos are up to over 40 minutes, just going line by line by line by line by line, word by word, uh, digging into the meanings of the poems. So I read the poems and I go line by line, look at the themes and devices and so on. So for this session, we're just looking at questions or maybe things that I might have missed in those videos. All right, we're going to move on to the next point, but let's take a, a one a one minute break or a two minute break, and then we'll move on to to to, um, to a couple more points. Hopefully, we can get through at least ten points today. So, why don't we just take a quick break? Take a quick break. We'll come back, and then we'll blaze through some other points all right quick break quick break quick break
Okay, why don't we move on? Touch on the next poem. Uh, Imani is saying, uh, Michelle is saying, this poem seems to be, seems as viewed from a feminist perspective. I can definitely see some, a little bit of feminism because the women in the poem are said to be contentless. So maybe the speaker is saying, you know, we are not happy with the gender rules. We need to see more equality. That that could definitely be a perspective that you can take from this poem. Certainly, that's a good point. Is the speaker a male or a female child? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> Maybe we don't know for sure. Do we have any evidence to suggest one way or the other? I think it could be either way. I, I talk quite a bit about who, about the speaker and possibilities for the speaker um, in my lesson on this point. So you can check that out. Uh, all right, why don't we jump to, this is the dark time, my love. Uh, oh, before that, there's one more thing, one more question from Carissa. Sir, it it is, Showing how the cycle would be. Oh, okay. We, we already touched on that. So this is the dark time, my love. This is one of my favorite poems on the syllabus. And this was actually one of my favorite videos to make, my video on this poem. All right. Do we have any questions about this poem? Remember, I'm not doing an analysis of the poems. I'm just... Um, taking questions, seeing if we can iron out some, any confusion about the poems. Yeah, Jamaica is a fan of this poem as well. This is the dark time, my love. Do we have any problems with this poem? This can definitely be compared to Dolce at the Coramist. Nas, definitely, definitely, no doubt. These, uh, they are both war poems, both war poems. Uh, this is one of the poems that can be compared to a number of poems on the syllabus. We see war in this poem, and there's also patriotism, nationalism, um, imperialism, colonization, which means we can also compare it to poems like uh, South, uh, poems like uh, even Test Match Sabina Park, poems like uh, An African Thunderstorm. Yeah, these, these poems deal with, you know, basically one country dominating another or, you know, two regions or two countries clashing in some way. So yeah, yeah, this can definitely be compared to an African thunderstorm. Certainly, certainly, certainly. All right, any questions about the lines? Do we focus on the elections? No, we, we, we really shouldn't necessarily go so deeply into the historical context. Um, it's better to support your points um, using the lines. You can mention, you can mention um, things outside, but make sure your whatever you're mentioning is not the focus, but just like uh, one piece of support. But most of the evidence or all of the evidence should be from the text itself. So e even if you're aware of like um, some things that happened outside of the poem, things that might have triggered certain events or certain uh, conflicts, your focus should really be 
the poem itself and the words of the poem. Uh, so if you had to choose, what is one of the major devices in this poem? Imagery. Imagery. This is the dark time I love all around the land, brown beetles. We see the shining sun hidden in the sky. Personification as well. The sun hidden in the sky. The red flowers are bending their heads in awful sorrow. That's imagery and personification right there. We see... Uh, so yeah, natural imagery. Quite a bit of natural imagery. We see the sun hiding itself. We see the flowers bending their heads. With his, we see the grass being trampled upon. And this natural imagery serves to show us um, basically the the suffering, the 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 strain, and the problems that presumably Guyana faced during this time. The sun hiding could definitely be just that that spirit of gloom. You know, the sun is, usually represents brightness, joy, brilliance, a bright future, but that future is hiding because of, of what's going on, because of, you know, this oppression. We also see the flowers bending their heads, you know, red flowers, bright red flowers usually rep represent things like uh, romanticism, love, but it, it's almost as if there is no, this is not a time for love. It's a time for war, it's a time for sorrow. And then we see the grass being trampled in stanza three. Grass, this could represent the growth of the country being trampled upon by the oppressors. Can we compare this to, definitely we can compare this to, um, it is the constant image of her face. In both poems, we see basically um, multiple countries interacting. Yeah, we can put it that way. Uh, paradox, oxymoron, uh, in this poem, let's see. Mm, I wouldn't go as far as to say paradox, but there's oxymoron in festival of guns because usually a festival is is a joyful time, but then you have guns. And carnival of misery. Carnival should be celebration, dancing, but we have misery, carnival of misery. So we have two oxymorons. And these oxymorons are, are, are quite clever. Um they kind of demonstrate the two sides of, of the coin, the two perspective, per perspectives. So we see the, the perspectives of the, the, um, the oppressors. For them, it's like a carnival. It's like a festival. They're just having fun. But for the people being oppressed, it's, it's misery. Uh... uh a uh, true, true favor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Loving both woman and country. In This Is the Dark Time, My Love, you can say that the speaker is talking to his wife, or well, not necessarily wife, his lover, or maybe the My Love is actually his country. He's personifying the country. Could be either way. Similarly, in... This is the constant image of your face. Um, some persons think that the speaker is dealing with a country and a lover, while other persons like myself think that the person is dealing with two countries. But definitely there are many points of comparison between those two points. Yeah, coffee, coffee says it perfectly. It can, be, it can be both just depending on how you choose to interpret it. Yeah, I, I, I also think that the my love here is it's just the, the speaker personifying the country. He's telling the country or, the, you know, the countrymen, the people of the country, you know, this is a time for us to be militant. This is a time for us to, you know, wake up, smell the coffee, see what's going on. It, it, it's not a, a laughing matter. We need, we need to understand that there is a strange invader trying to take advantage of us, you know. What can we do about it? Basically what I'm getting. Yeah, I, I think the per, the persona is writing to his country, 
But uh, if you say he's writing to his loved one, that's also a possibility. But I think there's more evidence to suggest that he's writing to his country. Because, uh, yeah, the entire poem is basically talking about the situation in the country. So it's almost as if he's appealing to the country to, 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 to recognize the situation, first of all. All right, any other questions on this point before we move on? Yeah, ju juxtaposition, juxtaposition or oxymoron would be better than, would be a better fit than paradox when it comes to these um, contradictory or seemingly contradictory lines. Festival of Guns, Carnival of Misery. You had a question about the flag. What What is your... Oh, here we are. How would you explain the lines that allude to the Guyanese flag? Uh, oh, I guess you're, you're making reference to my video. Well, I'm not sure if they would ask a question that would directly force you to, to talk about that, but you could mention... You can you you could mention if if you are stating in the essay if you're stating in your essay that uh, this poem is about Guyana and oppression in Guyana, then the the lines that make reference or allude to the Guyanese flag you could use that as as evidence to support the fact that this is about uh, the Guyanese oppression the oppression that Guyana faced some years ago. And for those who have no idea what I'm what I'm talking about, um, oh, where are they? Basically, the colors of the Guyanese flag kind kind of match up with the the imageries, the natural imageries. We we see the red flowers, the sun shining, which I guess is yellow or gold, and the grass, which is green, the slender grass. These these are colors of the Guyanese flag. So you, you could, I, I wouldn't say that it's a very strong allusion. It's very subtle. The poet might not have intended it at all, but it's, it's an interesting point. Uh, what, what theme? Yeah, so as so what question they would ask, it would just be any question that would that would allow you to write about um, the contents of the poem being connected to Guyana. Then you could basically mention this allusion, this very subtle allusion, as a piece of evidence, as long as you can you know, explain it properly. All right, I think I missed a, I missed a couple of um, comments from from Lakeisha, for the persons who asked me to elaborate a little. So, oh, I guess Lakeisha is still on Orchids, okay. Is this poem about Guyana? I think it's about Guyana, but when writing your essays, the focus will not be on the historical context. The focus will have to be on the lines of the poem. So whether or not you want to say it's about Guyana, stay within the poem and you know, quote the lines, focus on the words of the poem. We can't really focus on, on the history itself and go into history books. For evidence, we have to focus on on the lines of the poem and what they're saying directly. Yes, exactly. This this comment is 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 what I'm talking about. It's it's better to to mention the speaker talking about his country. The poem does not say Guyana specifically, 
So it might be better to to just refer to the country, the country, the speaker's country, the speaker's homeland. So you can use the context of the poem to help your understanding of the poem. But when writing the essay, you want to stick within the poem itself and not try to go outside the poem to find evidence. Oh, interesting. Michelle's dad was from Guyana. All right. How many of you guys saw saw my lesson on this poem? I I, I made a few references to the flag and the colors. Um uh, C-Sex Circle also has a, a pretty good video on this poem. All right, are, are the lines clear in this poem? Any strange, any strange line, any, any strange diction? Pretty clear stuff. We know the devices. We know the devices. Even see a couple of rhetorical questions in the last stanza. All right, why don't we jump to the next point? An African thunderstorm. Here we have another kind of nature poem and also a colonization poem so some some people read this poem and say it has nothing to do with colonization it's just a storm man versus nature well others like myself read the poem and say this is definitely this storm is definitely a symbol for colonization there is so much evidence in the text to suggest that so do we understand what's happening in this point do we have any any questions about this point We're talking about an African thunderstorm. Any questions about the African thunderstorm? If not, if not, if not. Okay, I see some comments. There's a liter literal and metaphorical meaning that there is a storm. But also the storm represents an invasion, I think. Yeah, I think you are spot on. The literal storm is, you know, wrecking the African village. But I think the storm represents the colonization that happened in Africa, where we have Western countries. We see that the storm is coming from the West, the Western world is what this might be pointing to those powerful countries that exploited, you know, the African countries. And we see that the storm is like a plague of locusts. This is a biblical allusion. And we know that the locusts in the Bible brought destruction. You know, the locusts are insects that, that just eat up all the crops. So similarly, the colonizers just bring destruction. They bring peril and death. Uh, sinister dark wings. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a lot there's a lot of um, imagery that speaks to colonization. Here, can you comment on the structure of the poem? Ah, all right. In first of all, we see that there are very few punctuation marks throughout the entire poem. Look at stanza one, we have one comma, one period. Look at stanza two, we have uh, 
just a, just a few punctuation marks. Most poems would have more commas and periods than these. The reason is just as the storm is relentless and powerful and fast and uh, reckless, you know, the poem itself is taking on that haphazard, random recklessness with with the lack of punctuation. Yeah, so that's one of the main things I talk about when it comes on to the form of the poem. Uh, also, take a look at where we have some short, sharp lines turning sharply here and there. It's almost as if most of the short lines are short to reinforce some kind of speed turning sharply. That's the quick movement of the storm here and there. It's like the storm is everywhere at once. Uh, look, look down here again. Dart about, in and out. Look at this, these short lines, this rhyming couplet, the darting about. In, in, in this case, the shortness of the lines is representing like the quickness with which the mothers are just trying to find a safe place. So yeah, those are some ways in which the form can, can be looked at. From which theme should we explain this poem? Well, either, both. It just depends on whether you think the storm is a symbol or the storm is just literal. If you think it's just a literal storm, then you will be focusing on nature, man versus nature, the destructiveness of nature, and so on. If you think that the storm represents colonization, then you can instead focus on the colonization aspect. But I, either way would be fine. So this poem, you could link it to poems that deal with colonization, or you could link it to poems that deal with nature. Just depends on basically how the essay is set up. So it's one of those flexible poems. That's a good thing. Uh, from the West, have any significance to the metaphorical meaning? Definitely, definitely. The West, uh, West in terms of uh, geopolitics, the Western world speaks to country, speaks to Europe and the Ameri uh, North America, uh, Canada, these rich, powerful countries. So basically the storm, if we're looking at the thunderstorm as being colonization, <coughs> excuse me, then we can see that the storm is coming from where? From the West, which means it's coming from these Western countries. So the storm or the problem of colonization, it's coming from the Western countries. And where did it end up? It ended up right here in Africa. So that I think is the main symbolic uh, significance of from the West. Uh, major literary device in this poem, definitely we have lots and lots of imagery, especially in the, the latter stanzas. Uh, look, at the, look at the auditory imagery, screams of delighted children, in the din of the whirling wind, even some alliteration there. Look at more imagery down at the end, the jagged blinding flashes, rumble, tremble, crack. This is all imagery. And symbolism or metaphor, if you think that the storm represents um, colonialism. Yeah. yeah, that's a pretty good comment. Personification, let's see from the West. Yeah, the clouds come hurrying, that's personification. The clothes are being, you know, they're given the, that kind of human will and life. They're hurrying. They're turning sharply. Uh, the storm is tossing up things on its tail. That's a metaphor because humans don't have tails. So here the storm is being compared to a beast. Just as a, a beast is wild and crazy and dangerous, the storm is just as crazy. And we have a simile here, like a madman chasing nothing. 
just as a madman just has no sense of direction this storm is just moving like it's crazy destroying anything in its way pregnant clothes uh this is not necessarily personification because this just means the clothes are full of rain but we know that metaphorically speaking the clothes are pregnant not just with rain but with danger uh, the clouds are riding on the on the wind's back or on the storm's back. So that's personification. The storm is gathering to perch on hills. That's metaphor, because the comparison is to a bird. We have perch, birds perch. A simile here, gathering to perch on hills like sinister dark wings. The wind whistles by auditory imagery, the wind whistling by, and also alliteration with the whoo, whoo sound being repeated. And the trees bend to let it pass, personification. The trees are bending to let the storm pass. Almost like the trees are saying, yeah, come, come, come. I, I will just give up, and you can pass. So we see a difference between how, how nature handles the disaster and how humans handled, handled the disaster. The trees, the nature just gives in and allows the storm to pass. While the people are running about and panicking and trying to fight back, stuff like that. Screams of delighted children toss and turn in the din of the whirling wind. This is also personification because the, sh the screams are tossing and turning. The screams are tossing and turning, meaning the, ch the kids are screaming and the wind is so loud that it's like the wind is grabbing onto the screams and throwing them about. The wind is basically louder than the screams. Uh, similarly here, clothes wave like tattered flags flying off to expose dangling breasts and lots of imagery and uh, onomatopoeia, as jagged blinding flashes rumble, tremble, and crack. Uh, yeah, so there, there are so many devices in this poem. Wow, I missed a couple of comments. Uh, like a plague of locusts. Yes, that's definitely biblical allusion, referring to the plagues of Egypt. So, yeah, check that out. Yeah, important comment here from Deandra. Ooh, good question, Savannah. <clears throat> Why were the children delighted about the colonization? <clears throat> now let's take a look at this line. In the village, screams of delighted children. So even though they're delighted, they're screaming. Scream has an undertone of panic. Anyway, the children might be delighted because they are naive, they're excited about the storm because they don't understand the danger that it brings. I, in, my, in my lesson on the storm, I, I mentioned my experience with Hurricane Ivan in 2004. That was my first hurricane. And in the midst of the hurricane, I was delighted. I was screaming in, in, in excitement. Because I didn't quite understand that, you know, a hurricane brings destruction and death. I thought it was just a nice excitement and a nice excuse to not have school, a nice reason to not have to go to school. So similarly, the screams of the children might suggest that the young people or the children are just not knowledgeable enough to understand the, the danger that colonization or the storm brings. Ah, coffee. Coffee is making quite a, quite a quite a good comment here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows their innocence, their naivete, more accurately. Yeah, they they don't quite understand what's happening. For them, it's it's excitement. But even though their excitement, pay attention to the word scream. So that still suggests that there is some amount of panic happening. And we see contrast in the poem, in how. With the contrast in how nature deals with the storm versus how 
humans deal with the storm, but also we see contrast in how the children respond to the storm versus how the adults respond. The mothers are running about panicking while the kids are just having a grand time. Yeah, pregnant clothes, definitely personification. Uh, well, sorry, my bad. Not not necessarily personification, um, because as I said, the clothes could just literally be pregnant with rain. That's just a, a common a common way to say that the clothes are full of rain. Not not necessarily um, personification per se, because it's not as if the clothes are you know pregnant in the in the way that a, a human would be pregnant. Funny how in an African thunderstorm, and this is the dark time I love, we see the invaders as insects, pests. Wow, interesting comparison. Very interesting. We, we, we see the locusts. The storm is compared to a plague of locusts here. And in this is the dark time, the brown beetles that crawl about, that, that metaphor is used to talk about the, uh, the invading soldiers. So in both points, the insects bring destruction. The insects are a destructive force. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting point. Yeah. Any other questions or interesting points? All right, so why don't we jump down to the next poem? Do you guys have a list of questions ready? <laughs> Dolce, this is my poem. Any questions about this poem? Any interesting comments? Oh, the pregnant clothes, okay, so back to thunderstorm. The pregnant clothes could take on the character traits of pregnant women. Ooh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yes, definitely, it would definitely be a subtler um, usage of personification. <clears throat> the clothes are pregnant and Bare breasts and bare breasts were exposed. Is this somehow linked? Uh, in in my opinion, the there's not much of a linkage. But if you can find a, a connection, then that would be interesting. What what I would say if I want to link these is, if you want to suggest that there are some sexual undertones in the poems um if we link if we link to colonization we see the dangling breasts and even blinding flashes flashes has, a, has another meaning we could wonder if the colonizers were abusing some of these women you know raping and pillaging so i guess pregnant clothes might link back to that but it's a little bit of a, of a stretch i i think uh, sir, would the line with dangling breasts be an allusion to assault from colonists? Uh, it, it wouldn't be an allusion because it's not really making reference to any particular event or any particular person. But it could, I, I think it actually suggests uh, some kind of violation of these women. I think so. Because look at the last line here. Clothes wave like tattered flags. So we, we can imagine these women, they have their clothes being ripped, ripped off them by the storm. And remember, if the storm represents colonization, then 
in this case, maybe we'd have the colonizers, you know, ripping off the clothes to expose dangling breasts. If you're ripping off clothes and exposing dangling breasts, then I wonder what's going on. And then flashes to, to flash actually means to briefly unintentionally or intentionally expose one's naked body. So that word has a little hidden meaning there. So there are, there are, there's a, a, a couple of, there are a couple of evidences. There are some diction in the last stanza to suggest that there might have been some violation happening. Right. All right. We have jumped down to Dolce. We're almost um, coming up on two hours. Let's let's get some questions rolling. Dolce et decorum est. This is the war poem. The war poem. Uh, yes, this can be compared to the woman speaks because both poems deal with, uh, I would say, violence, especially gun violence and the effects that, you know, such violence can have. It is so funny how the meaning of the title. Yeah, the meaning is, is, is basically ironic. Dolce et decorum est, it is sweet and fitting, but the speaker is basically showing us that, yes, definitely ironic chamoy. Uh, the speaker is actually saying that it is not sweet and fitting. You think it is sweet and fitting because that's what we've been told. But I have gone through the experience of war. I have seen it firsthand and I can tell you the truth. There is nothing sweet or fitting about war. So the title is definitely ironic. Uh, when we see the last lines, it becomes clear that the title is ironic because the speaker says that it is a lie. Dolce et decorum est pro patra mori is a lie. So the title is a lie. Expectation versus reality is a huge theme in this poem, certainly, because, uh, you know, the, the soldiers upon being recruited, they would expect that, you know, the battlefield, on the battlefield, they will find glory and honor. But the reality is, it's just a brutal, savage place to die. You know, the, the speaker is, 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 is trying to show us the reality that war is not sweet and fitting, even though many people have this expectation, this false notion that it's, you know, a heroic thing to become a soldier and to die for your country, to fight for your country. Uh, is the ecstasy of fumbling an oxymoron or irony? I would say it's an oxymoron, ecstasy of fumbling, because, you know, ecstasy is like this feeling of immense pleasure but then, but then you're fumbling in this dangerous situation. So how can this be ecstatic? So I'd say, I'd say it's an oxymoron. It's almost as if these men are on drugs. They're kind of high and drunk just because of how fatigued and how panicked they are. And so maybe that's, that's why this word is used. So oxymoronic language there. Yeah, good point there. Any other questions about the lines? This poem has some of the most uh, difficult imagery. So if, if some of the lines are unclear, just let me know and we can go through those lines. By the way, there are a couple of versions of this poem. Um, in that a few lines, uh, what line is it? Uh, 
to learn about the gas shells. In, in some versions, two lines are a little bit different. Can someone explain to me what is meant by oxymoron? Uh, an oxymoron happens when we have two words that are opposite in meaning or highly contrasting in meaning, but they're placed basically side by side. For example, uh, we mentioned ecstasy of fumbling. Uh, and ecstasy means basically uh, happiness, not, not really happiness, but extreme pleasure. Fumbling is basically the opposite, especially in this situation. So oxymoron. These words are side by side. Is a theme survival? Definitely survival can be a theme. Um, the the soldier didn't survive. The dead soldier, uh, we see that one soldier died from the gas attack, but the speaker himself survived the literal battle, but he, he didn't really survive, um, you know, mentally because he has post-traumatic stress disorder. He's feeling so much guilt, so much trauma, so much pain. Has he really survived? But yes, yeah, sur survival can definitely be a theme in this poem. Uh, someone asks major devices major device uh, imagery is a huge device here um, we have some sonic devices like uh, cacophony personification uh, sorry cacophony personification uh, sorry cacophony alliteration and um, consonants assonance I won't go into those now, but you can watch the lesson on that, um, on this poem. But yeah, imagery is definitely one of the main devices here. There are several metaphors as well. Uh, old beggars on the sacks is also ironic. So there should not be beggars because they're paid Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, their, their beggars are, yeah, well, they're not beggars. They're like old beggars because, you know, even if, if they have a good salary, even if they're paid, they're, they're still very poor in that they will not be able to live any high quality of life. They'll not be able to enjoy life because they're going through this terrible experience and, Basically, they're gonna die a horrible death. So they're they're like beggars, and they're like beggars on the sacks. You know, the beggars might carry their sack with their belongings, and similarly, the soldiers' kit bags. You know, that they're wearing to 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 move with are just as heavy. Okay. What does he mean by, in all my dreams before my helpless sight? All right, let's look at this line. In all my dreams. So the first two stanzas of the poem are in the past tense, right? The first two stanzas are in the past tense. So the soldier is reflecting on the battlefield experience that he had, but in stanza three, this this two-line stanza, it switches to present tense. And now he's talking about how that battlefield experience affects him in his current life. So in his current life, he's having nightmares. In all my dreams before my helpless sight. Helpless sight because he can't help having the nightmares. He's constantly seeing, you know, the gas attack, his comrade dying the blood, the gore, the gunshots, the bodies. And what he's seeing specifically in his nightmares, he's seeing the, the soldier who died. So there's one soldier who, who was killed by the gas attack in stanza two. He sees this guy plunging at him. So in the nightmares, he sees the soldier who couldn't manage to get the mask on. 
trying to reach out for help. But of course, it's a dream, so he can't help the dying man. The man is already dead in real life. So the man is plunging at him, guttering, choking, drowning. This is just um, Dixon talking about how he's like gasping for air and taking his final breaths, trying, trying to survive. So in all my dreams before my helpless sight, it's talking about the nightmares or even hallucinations that the speaker is now having because of the trauma, the battlefield trauma. Incurable sores on innocent tongues. Can we say that the poet had switched from talking about the experience of one soldier to more than one soldier's? Yeah, innocent tongues. So he's not just talking about the, the dead soldier, but basically all of these soldiers are young men. They are young men. They're they are basically innocent. You know, they're kids. 18, 19, 20 recruited into the army. They are sold this dream that, hey, join the army. You can be a hero. Fight for your country. This is, the, you know, the honorable thing to do. But basically, these men are, are, they're innocent in the sense that they don't deserve to die like this. They don't deserve to die like this. So, of course, you have like the sores on the tongue, the literal sores on this dying man's tongue because sores are coming up and i don't even, even want to explain that that nasty imagery but definitely he's talking about you know in general these young men who are on the battlefield dying they're like innocent kids who have basically signed up to to die without even realizing it they have signed up to die a pointless and horrible death All right, can, can you tell me what simile you're talking about? True favor, consultancy. Oh, you mean uh, the, the beggars under sacks, I guess, yeah. I guess that's what you mean. Yeah, this poem definitely has some gruesome imagery. So is, uh, is is every line clear on this poem? Bent double like old beggars on the sacks. All right, we see something else coming in. Old beggars on the sacks could mean that soldiers were weak or tired. Yeah, old beggars would be, you know, they're old, so they're like limping, hunched back, just barely crawling, barely moving. The imagery in the first stanza is just showing us how exhausted, how, how mentally and physically strained and drained these soldiers are. We see they're not need. You know, this means, oh, like the, the knees are close together. They're not literally not need, but they're basically falling over. They can't even stand up straight. They're coughing like hags. You know, like old sick women coughing. Maybe they're coughing up blood because they're so injured. We cursed through sludge. They're cursing because, you know, on the battlefield, it's just such a miserable experience. You know, you're cursing. You, you, you're, you're feeling this misery. You, you, you can't even contain it. And the sludge here is just talking about, you know, like the, the dirt, the mud, the the bodies, all of that debris that the soldiers would have to go through. So this entire first stanza is just depicting the, the desperate conditions of the soldiers. Men marched asleep. They're so exhausted, they're basically sleeping. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. Talking about men who, who got their legs or feet shut off, you know, decapitated, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue. You're so tired, I can't even see. The battlefield is so blared and so dark, you can't see anything. Drunk with fatigue. Have you ever been so exhausted that you feel as if you're drunk? That's, that's what these men are dealing with.
Yeah, this is definitely the case of the the nightmares in stanza three. The the soldier who died from the gas attack, it's like he's haunting the speaker. So long after the war ends, there is still that trauma, that, that effect that lingers in the mind. Are they old though? Yeah, they're not old. But because they're so weak and feeble, it's like they're old. It's as if they're old men, but they're not young. They're not old at all. I imagine they're pretty young. Some of them even 18. So they are not, they're not old at all. I I I wouldn't say it's it's I wouldn't say there is irony in, in, in the simile. I'm not sure if you're referring to this simile here. Bent double like old beggars on the sacks. They're like old beggars. It's, it's a little ironic, the comparison. But I guess the point of the comparison is not the age, but the, the, the condition of the men. So there's a, a little bit of irony, you could say. Is the essay writing session tomorrow being recorded? It, it, I think it's going to be on, on, up, up on YouTube. I hope so. It can be compared under the theme of patriotism, but the imagery would be weak to compare as war. Patriotism is definitely a strong theme in this poem. War is a strong theme. Imagery is a strong device. Are there any any difficult metaphors in this in this poem? Any any images that are just impossible to understand? All good? All good? All right. I think we can we can move to the next point. All hike. All hike. All hike. Any questions about this poem? Oh, what's this? Uh, okay. Was about comparing Dolce with constant image. Yeah, the war aspect wouldn't fit with it is the constant image, but if you if you want to look at patriotism, then I suppose. How many points? I think we, we we'll just go until we're tired. <laughs> we'll just go until we're tired or until my son wakes up. It's four minutes past midnight for me, but I still have a little bit of gas in the tank. All right, Ol Haig, do we have any questions about this? Your favorite poem, Ol Haig? Wow, interesting. Any questions about Ol Haig? Any questions about Ol Haig? No, all hike is, is easy. You can skip this one. No questions. So all hike should be clear. We know the themes. We, we know we're dealing mainly with identity. Main device in all hike. Uh, imagery, rhetorical question. Those jump out at me. Uh, there are quite a few similes and metaphors as well major themes and devices uh, by the way guys i i have two videos one in which i deal with the major themes across all the points 
one in which I deal with the major devices. So check those out for more information on the major themes and devices in the poems. Uh, poems that can be compared to this and the major themes. So all high, we're dealing we're dealing with an old woman who doesn't really enjoy being herself. She's addicted to the blood of babies, and she is basically rejected or isolated from from society because of who she is. So any poem that deals with identity or self acceptance, these are poems that we could compare. So mirror would be a good one. Mirror deals with identity, self-acceptance. Uh, Dreaming Black Boy deals with social isolation. You see a, a, a speaker who is kind of... Um, not treated well by society. He's not acknowledged by his teacher. You see the racism and so on. So yeah, Dreaming Black Boy is, is a poem we could compare to Ole Haig as well. Is there more than one Ole Haig? <laughs> I, I wonder the same thing, Kimberly. I think this poem is talking about one Haig, but uh, I don't know if there are like many Haigs or, or just one Haig. I, I really don't know. <laughs> they know how to kill her, but has anyone succeeded in killing her? I don't know. Yeah, supernatural, superstition, and super in mirror. Um, there, there's more. There's more about identity than than about superstition in mirror, I believe. Yeah, I guess a myth, so she can never be killed as long as someone believes. <laughs> that that's a good line when you think about line four to frighten the foolish. So basically, the high is doing all of this madness to frighten the foolish. Who are the foolish? The foolish are the people who believe in the high, which, prob which probably means, as I mentioned in my lesson on, on all high, if you do not believe in the high, you cannot be hurt by the high. Yeah. And we see at the end, a poor old high like me can never do it. Maybe because... There will always be people believing in the hag. There will always be women giving birth. There will always be people who want, who need to blame somebody when babies die. And so the hag will always survive because there's a place in society for the hag. You know, the hag needs, needs to take this blame. Yeah, basically. Uh, what is the tone and mood? The tone, uh, tone, frustration. The Haig seems to be frustrated and fed up with her place in society, with what she has to do. Uh, there's also a tone of uh, yearning. She's actually longing to just to be a regular person, I think, and to, to be accepted. The Haig is, is pretty sarcastic as well. She, she's pretty feisty in all these rhetorical questions and so on. Mood, uh, how does this point make me feel? Uh, maybe, maybe. Hmm. You know, I feel some sympathy toward the Haig. I actually feel sympathy when I read this point. Because the Haig, the Haig basically is is dealt a bad hand. She she's blamed for the the deaths of the babies, you know. She's being cussed out by all of these women. Yeah, pity, sympathy. Uh, Imani says reflective. Mm. That's an interesting one. Uh, sir, 
so so the only reason she kills the babies is because well actually there there are a few perspectives you can take on on the babies being killed first of all is the hag really killing the babies or are the mothers simply blaming the hag when the babies die which is it really look at the last stanza how would you mother name your ancient dread the ancient dread is you know this fear of one's old one's own child dying how would you mother name your ancient dread and who to blame who to blame for the murder inside your head the murder is inside the mother's head so maybe some of these mothers killing their own babies but the hag is the one being blamed the hag is the one being blamed. This whole myth of the hag is, is like a blame game. It's just finding somebody to put the blame on. And, you know, when, when we don't understand certain things, we don't understand why why babies die, how, how these tragedies happen, we need something to blame. We need someone to blame. So the hag has to fill that gap. And if, if you think the hag is actually killing the babies, uh, based on stanza two, uh, then it would be she's killing the babies because she needs to survive. She needs to drink the baby's blood in order to live. But this, I think, is just the myth of the hike. This is what people believe. <laughs> so, yeah, she, yeah, it is, it is well said right here. She's just a scapegoat. I'm highlighting some comments as we go along. Sir, I think it is both. What 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 is both? I'll 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 say. What is both? But of course, um and gray, the the catwoman and the spinning wheel. I believe it's the same high, you know. <laughs> I think it's the very same hag in that story. If not the hag, it's it's it's, it's a character that's very connect, very much connected to the hag. Yeah, because we see some similar behaviors with the shedding of the skin, turning into a ball of fire, roaming at night. Yeah, and there 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 there's some allusion to like the myth of of the hag, the actual folklore, the stories. Because we see here, for example, in stanza one, to count a thousand grains of rice, you know, if you put rice at your front door, the hag has to count the rice grains before she enters. That's alluding to that myth. Uh, what else? Gallivanting all night without skin refers to how the hag turns into a ball of fire, sheds its skin and turns into a ball of fire. Uh, what else? There's something about salt being able to, to hurt the hag. Also allusion. Can you say that the hag is addicted to the taste of baby blood? Definitely. That is very clear. If only babies didn't smell so nice. She, it's like you, you pass KFC and you smell that chicken and you can't help but to just approach the chicken. That is how the babies are to the hike. And if only, and if I could only stop hearing the soft, soft call. So she wants to stop hearing the call of the baby's blood. It's like the baby's blood is calling out to the hike. So she's definitely addicted to the blood of the babies. So the hike isn't real. Well, it depends on how you interpret the poem. I think the hike is just the imagination of the mothers of the community and basically the poem is explaining how people imagine the hike to be and what people imagine the hike to do so if you want to say that the hike is real in the poem or if you want to say that the hike is just a myth it, it, both ideas are, are fine but what we should take from from the point mainly, whether or not the hike is real, is the hag's 
purpose in society, how she's a scapegoat, how she's blamed for, for the tragedies and how she has identity, an identity crisis because she's addicted to the baby's blood and all of that, but she, she doesn't want to, to live in this way. She just wants to eat regular food like everybody else. Look at stanza one. She wants to eat black pudding like normal people. She doesn't want to drink baby's blood, but she can't help it. So it raises the question, can we change who we are? Can we help who we are? Yeah, her purpose is basically to be the scapegoat and relieve some guilt from these mothers, I believe. <clears throat> and yeah, a lot of a lot of people, especially older people, still believe in things like hikes. So yeah, I'll, I'll say uh, some people say that the hag does not kill the babies. Some people say that she kills the babies. So you can you can interpret it either way, I think. But in my opinion, the hag does not kill the babies, but she gets blamed for it because the mothers just need somebody to blame. That's what I think. See, so Brianna breaking down some tones here frustration in stanza one she's asking all these all, all of these rhetorical questions she's just fed up with her you know these habits that she can't get rid of this lifestyle and then it becomes sympathetic after that because she's begging us to understand just please understand i can't help it i'm addicted to the baby's blood and i can't do anything about it so the Hayek wants us to feel sorry for her in those lines. Uh, in stanza three, nonchalant, I, I would go past even nonchalant and say the Hayek is actually a little bit prideful, a little bit proud in how she's saying, well, I can't die. I will always have my purpose to serve, so you can't get rid of me. So she sounds almost as if she has accepted her role in society and she's a bit proud of herself. <laughs> yeah, not, not much remorse in the last line. I think the rhetorical question helped to bring across what the Hayek is trying to say. Yeah, the Hayek is trying to appeal to our emotions with the rhetorical questions. Hag is trying to get us to contemplate her, her situation, her problem, and try to put ourselves in, in her shoes. When we ask people rhetorical questions, it forces them to, to think deeply on what we're saying. So that is what the Hag is doing. She's trying to get understanding and sympathy through the rhetorical questions. Yeah, the hag, the hag is like a vampire, <laughs> like a vampire who specializes in baby blood. Wow, that's worse than a vampire. Ah, postpartum depression. Interesting. Um, interesting that you bring that up. Some in extreme cases of postpartum, um, postpartum depression, postpartum depression happens to, uh, to 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 many women. You know, after they give birth. They go into a period of, you know, depression, basically, as the name suggests. But some women actually go to the extent of killing their babies. That that happens. So the high is saying, well, I am only here for, so you can blame me when that happens. So the murder inside your head is basically insinuating that it's really the mothers who are responsible for the baby's deaths, even though... The hag is being blamed. Nakisha insists in, in, insists that black pudding is good. Uh, 
Ooh, that's that's a brilliant theme, nature versus nurture. The Hayek is is trying her best to to kind of nurture away her nature, but she 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 can't help it. So nur- nurture versus nature is is kind of on the identity, 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 and also like also social social identity. You know your place, your role in society. So that's definitely a theme there. Maybe the reference to black pudding suggests that she takes blood otherwise. Well, she wants to take blood otherwise. You think I wouldn't rather take my blood seasoned in fat black pudding? So instead of drinking the baby blood, she would wish to just eat black pudding, of which blood is an ingredient. So just like everybody else drink blood, but they don't drink human blood, they drink you know, I guess it's cow's blood in the black pudding. So the hag wishes that that could satisfy her appetite, but black pudding just doesn't work for the hag. She needs baby blood. Yeah, and th- this is a part of the, the, the sympathy that the hag is trying to get. The hag is explaining that she doesn't have a choice. She has to kill. She has to eat the babies. She has to drink the baby's blood because it's the only way she's going to survive. She's afraid of the dying home. She's afraid to die. If she doesn't drink the blood, she's going to die. So what do you expect her to do? Yeah, basically, Alcia, I think that's what the last line means exactly. As long as more babies are being born, people are going to still need somebody to blame when tragedies happen. So the high will always exist because who else is going to take the blame? Yes, of course, I'm presenting points of both sides because... You know, there's no one. There's no one correct side. It's just about how you are able to justify, um, to justify your points. I I could write an essay saying that the Hague is a murderer, and I could write another essay saying that the Hague is the victim. And I could get full marks on both essays. <laughs> I I think. So yeah. Um, it's not necessarily about you know just trying to push one side as the correct side, but it's just about finding evidences that can support either side. If any of the women, yeah, w- women have miscarriages and also not just miscarriages, but young babies die also you know there's a thing called sids uh, sudden infant death syndrome something that i i've had i have to be super concerned with because i have a, a young baby so there there are many ways for babies to just die as as rough as that sounds so basically the high will always have something to do always have blame to get uh, what is kimberly asking could you explain where the dramatic monologue takes place dramatic monologue uh, perhaps the second stanza we could say is a dramatic monologue uh, if only babies didn't smell so nice and if i could only na 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 the Hayek is basically going through how addicted she is to the baby's blood. The entire poem could be seen as a dramatic monologue because the poem is the only one actually speaking. So the the the, the Hayek might be speaking to the women, but she's not really getting a response in the poem. So it's it's technically a monologue, the entire thing. All right. 
Da, 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 da. Any more questions on the hang? Uh, let's see here. The hike is speaking out loud. You're actually hearing her recitation. Yeah, so basically the entire poem is is one whole dramatic monologue. Because the the Haig is the only one speaking. She doesn't get a, a response. So if the Sukunyant, uh, Sukuyant, Sukunya uh, only exists, if the Haig only exists, so the mothers have an excuse, what would, what that would mean, it is actually the mothers who, well, the frightened, the foolish w w would refer to those people who believe in the Haig. So the the Haig is saying, you think I like to be gallivanting all night and frightening these stupid people? The stupid people are those who believe in the myth of the Haig. For example, these mothers. So the mothers and everybody else who believes in the Haig, they are stupid. Everybody who believes in the Haig, stupid people. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's such a sad, a, such a sad reality, such a sad possibility, Michelle. It's a, it's such a real thing, and because you know, especially mothers can't necessarily cope with that kind of loss and guilt, they need somebody to put all of this emotion on, all of this guilt on. So that's where the hike comes in. Uh, guys, for, for those of you who haven't watched um, the less, my lesson on Haig, definitely watch the lesson where I go into detail on all the lines. But for now, why don't we move on? We'll have to end soon. It's almost 12.30 on my side. Anyhow, let's press on through one or two more poems. My parents. I think this is an easy poem. Can we skip my parents? Are there any questions? about my parents. My parents kept me from children who were rough. Yeah, we can skip. I see two votes to skip. Skip, 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 skip. Okay, seems you can skip. Yeah, good point there about uh, dealing with tragedy and finding someone to blame. All right, let's skip my parents. What about little boy crying? Any problems with this poem? Is it a difficult poem? I, I don't think it's difficult. What do you guys think? Little boy crying. Skip. I see skip. All right. Not really. Not really. Yeah, so not difficult. Mm -hmm. I see some skipping happening. So I think, yeah. If you have a question, make it known because I'm going to skip it. Uh, with the memory, I guess we're still on the previous point. Would the memory of the death of a child be similar to Dulce? Ooh, that's that's interesting. We can see trauma coming out in both poems because postpartum depression, yeah, that it it it's it's similar to to PTSD. If a child if your child dies, you're gonna have some PTSD. So that would be an interesting way. If you get an essay question that asks you to uh, to look at trauma, for example, or suffering, then you could pull points from both poems. I don't understand this poem. All right, let's let's briefly look at what's going on in this poem. In basically, there's a little boy who 
his father catches him playing in the rain and decides to slap him. So the father slaps him for playing in the rain. The boy starts to cry and he starts to imagine that his father is this monster, this ogre, this giant, because he's just three years old. So he sees this moment of punishment as like, you know, for him, it's the end of the world. And we kind of see two different perspectives. We see a father who wants to discipline his son, teach him a lesson. But out of love, he really loves his son. He wants to, you know, how it says in terms of three, you do not understand the hurt your easy tears can scald him with. So the father is really hurt by the son's reaction. But he tries to put on a tough face so he can be a firm disciplinarian. Is it about, uh, I don't know if the child is spoiled. Uh, He's three years old, so maybe that's just how three-year-olds think. <laughs> yeah, he was playing in the rain, and the father... Right, let's look at each stanza. One minute per stanza. Stanza one, your mouth contorting in brief spite and hurt. So here we see the image of the, the boy making up his face because he's about to cry. Your laughter metamorphosed into howls. So the boy was happy at first. But then his laughter changed. Metamorphosis is like that evolutionary change, like a, a caterpillar to cocoon to butterfly, that kind of change. So the boy's laughter turns to holes or crying, crying sounds. Your frame so recently relaxed and tight. So the boy was relaxing because he was playing in the rain, having fun, but now his body is tight. With three-year-old frustration, I guess he's three years old, your bright eyes, swimming tears, uh, splashing your bare feet. You stand there angling for a moment's hilt of guilt or sorrow for the quick slap struck. So the boy is playing in the rain and bam, suddenly the father strikes him, maybe on, maybe on the face because, you know, it, it, the father maybe gets a, a bit too angry. It's, it could be seen as a, a harsh punishment, a little bit abusive, that's a three-year-old. Why are you going to slap a three-year-old like this? Anyway, the father slaps him. And in the st stanza two, I won't read stanza two. Stanza two is just showing that the little boy sees his father as a monster because of the slap. And then in stanza three, we see that even though the father slaps the child, he really wants to, you know, just hug him and play with him. But he feels as if he must be strict to teach his son a lesson. So that's basically what's happening in the poem. All right, let's see what questions uh, I've missed. Yeah, basically a little boy who's crying because his father slapped him for playing in the rain. Uh, yeah, this is something we, this perspective, we discussed this in our last Zoom meeting. Uh, the entire second stanza, it might be the son's perspective of the father because the son is angry. Or it might be the father's perspective of the son's perspective. So maybe the father is thinking, oh, my son hates me now because I just slapped him. We're not sure which one is really happening. So it could be either. Uh Ah, uh, Jack on Jack, Jack and the Beanstalk is definitely alluded to, I think, but I wouldn't say it's the, the main main device. The main device, uh, let me see. Zoomorphism, which is something some students like to call animalification, is a main is one of the main devices. We see lots of comparisons between the sun and animals with the metamorphosis at first, howls, we know wolves and dogs howl. Uh, we see something about monkey, I think, later on, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, okay, here it is. Bright eyes. Usually cats and nocturnal creatures are 
um, considered to be bright-eyed. It's also a metaphor that means the child is you know, naive, inexperienced. So there are lots of metaphors as well. But yeah, I, I go into all the devices in, in my lesson on this poem. So I don't think I'll, I'll go into the devices here. One of the most important metaphors is the metaphor of the mask. You see, like the, you see the father wearing a mask, and behind the mask is you know our, our scars and tears. What this means is the father is just pretending to be strict and unfazed, just pretending that he's not affected by how his son sees him. But in fact, he is deeply moved. He feels guilty and sorrowful when he sees how his son is crying. Uh, the father can also be thinking of the son symbolizing him as a grim giant. Yeah, so the stanza two has a lot of fairy tale imagery. So we can imagine the father might, might have been reading bedtime stories to the, to the child. And it's no like the father has become the villain in these stories. We see Grim Giant. Giant, a uh, very common villain in, in fairy tales. For example, Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, plotting deeper pits to trap him in. Usually, you know, the hero is trying to trap the, the bad guy. And chopping clean the tree he's scrambling down. More Jack and the Beanstalk um, allusion, as Gray mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say he's necessarily spoiled. He's just, he's three years old. What point of view is the poem in? Whoa, <laughs> what a question. All right, guys, before we wrap up, um, for those of you who do not have links to the poetry talk sessions, the Zoom meetings I had with other students and teachers, we discussed this poem quite a bit and we looked at the point of view of this poem. We had a quite a, a riveting discussion on the point of view. I'm going to give you guys links to those two meetings because those are not on YouTube and those will not be posted on YouTube. So what I'll do is in the description box, in the description box of this video, as soon as I end the stream, I will link um both meetings so you can download those and watch the recordings uh, domestic abuse maybe maybe <laughs> maybe maybe okay so yeah, some, some persons might say that it's just disciplining a child. But we, we don't we're not sure where this slap was um, where where this slap really hit. What if he, he slapped the boy's face? Could be a slap on the shoulder. I don't know. Could be abuse. Maybe, maybe not. What POV uh, I'm seeing a number of POV questions. Um, I'm going to send you guys the links to that video. There's a, at least five minutes of POV discussion for this poem. So in the meantime, let's jump to a, another poem. Uh, Gray, please watch, watch my video on this poem. You'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Or can I get the link? I'll I'll post the, the link in the description at the end of the live. We're gonna end soon and you guys must be tired. We're almost at three hours. A stone's throw. Any problems? Any problems with this poem? Any difficulties?
so yeah, um, before you guys go back to sleep, <laughs> somebody woke up pretty early to, to, to make this meeting. I'm going to post the link. Well, I'll post the link in maybe not immediately, but in a couple of minutes or in a couple of hours, and then you can just get, grab those videos. So in terms of understanding the points, I would suggest among other things, watch the 20 videos that I have on the poems, as well as the two Zoom meetings. Can you explain the biblical allusion? Okay, I'll touch on the biblical allusions in this point. There are a few biblical allusions. Oh, this is a stone's throw, a stone's throw, okay. I'm just, I, I was thinking about the woman speaks, uh, let's see. Biblical allusion. Well, the entire poem is a biblical allusion. <laughs> uh, this poem is like a retelling of the story of the, the adulteress who was caught in the act of adultery, you know, in the Bible. And the men were about to stone her, but Jesus intervened and basically said, you know, only those who have not sinned can attack her. Those without, you know, he without sin cast the first stone. So basically, everyone has sinned. None of you are perfect. So why are you judging this woman? That's what happened in the Bible. But the difference, you know, is that this poem is taking the perspective not of Jesus, not of the woman, but of one of the men who are about to stone the woman. Yeah, some people say it's Mary Magdalene. I think it's Mary Magdalene, but that's not that's not perfectly clear. Intertextuality, mm, that's a nice term. That just refers to one text, you know, making reference to or borrowing a lot from other texts. So yeah, in this case, we, we, we can just call it biblical illusion. The whole poem is biblical illusion. There's so much deadly, deadly, deadly imagery. Guys, if you haven't... If, if you have not watched my lesson on this poem, you have to watch it. I want do, do, do you guys realize that the speaker and the other men, their intention is to kill this woman and rape her dead body. D did you guys realize that? Are, are we looking at the same poem? These guys are about to rape a corpse. That's what's happening here. Not pretty, not pretty. Misogynist, worse than misogynist. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, any, 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 any difficult lines? Because we just want to blaze through as many poems as we can. Because tomorrow we're gonna be writing essays. We're not doing, we're not doing this tomorrow. We're writing essays tomorrow. Yeah, there are some, there's definitely, hypocrisy is one of the main themes in this poem. Because these men are definitely hypocrites. First of all, how can you uh, punish a sinner by sinning? Because stoning and killing and raping a woman, isn't, isn't that sinful? How, how can that be righteous? Masculinity versus, uh, masculinity versus femininity. Definitely. Yeah, because, you know, the men, of course, the woman didn't have adultery with herself. She must have you know, slept with some of these same men, I believe. But the woman is the one being stoned. So it's, it's a double standard. A double standard. Yeah. And so it's it's one of the gender poems. It, it can connect this with uh, bird shooting season when you're looking at gender. You can also connect it with uh, Dolce de Coromest or any of the any of those depressing poems when you look at suffering. You, you might get a que an essay question that talks about suffering. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. Expound on the raping corpse. I talk about this a lot in my in my in my lesson on the poem that you should watch. But uh, let's see. Let me just uh, look at look at it very briefly. 
the last assault. So in terms of four here, and if her fingers bruised her shuddering skin, these were love bites compared to the hail of kisses of stone. The last assault and battery, frigid rape. So they're planning to rape this woman. The last assault, they're now assaulting her physically, manhandling her, preparing to stone her. But after that, there's going to be one last assault, which is going to be frigid rape. Why is the rape frigid? Perhaps because this is a corpse. Corpses are cold. Frigid rape to come of right. And there's a, a cunning pun in come here, but I won't even go into all of that. Watch, watch the lesson video. This is a wicked, wicked poem. How did this poem make it onto the syllabus? I don't know. This poem and Dolce, deadly poems. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We, we see the attitude of the speaker, that attitude of superiority, that egotistical uh, mindset. They think that the, the woman is just... Is, basically an animal barely even human look at this look at how they they talk about how they abuse her tussled we roughed her up a little nothing much it's almost as if you know she deserves this abuse this is nothing for her this is fine this is okay and a part of the reason why they are so okay with abusing her is you know in their mind she's used to it she's used to men being all over her, right? Because she's a prostitute. So she should be fine with what we're doing. Yeah. 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 Double standard, hypocrisy, gender inequalities. These are themes we can find in this poem. Yes, it, it is a grotesque poem. And this is my question of the day. That's my question of the day. Anyway, guys, watch my video on this point. In the meantime, why don't we jump to constant image? Let's wrap up in, in 10 minutes. Do we have any problems with constant image? Yes, the frigid in frigid rape speaks also to the coldness, the coldness of the men's hearts the unfeeling nature of these men. That's one way to read it. Oh, really? You don't think they're trying to kill her and then rape her? <laughs> I definitely think they're, they're trying to rape and kill her in any order. Whether rape, then kill, or kill, then rape. They have the intention to do both, I think. Yeah, and this is the biggest irony in the poem. Irony is like the main, one of the main devices because these men are supposedly holy men, righteous men. So they say, but look at how they're behaving. They're savages. All right. What about constant image? Constant image. Any questions? Any difficulties with this poem? It is the constant image of your face. No other than which is the accurate interpretation of this poem? Is it two lovers or two countries? In my lesson, if you watch my lesson, you will see that I think there are two countries here. The speaker is personifying the countries because he's, he's comparing how much he loves both countries to how much a man would love two women. So it's a lot of personification happening. The man, uh, the, the speaker, he loves two countries. He loves his home country as well as like the country that he currently lives in. And he's comparing his love for these countries to a man's relationship to two women. So there are two countries, but the comparison is made to two women. 
And yeah, this is one of those points where knowing the biography, it helps a lot in understanding uh, what the poem is really about. Of course, in the exam, you, you can't dwell on the biography, but in your mind, you can use that to develop your ideas. What is the dominant device? Uh, let's see this question. And yeah, Shamoy, other person see it as one country and one lover as well. You could see it in that way, but I see it as two countries. Uh, what is the dominant device in the poem and why? Uh, personification, I think, is one of the main devices. Personification, because the countries are being compared to women, basically. And the love for countries being compared to, you know, like a, a romantic relationship or two romantic relationships. Almost like a, a, a man with a husband and a side chick. That's what's happening. There, there are several metaphors as well. We see the, fray, the face is framed in the speaker's hands. Metaphor there. Surveying me within my world of knives. Metaphor there. Conveying like, the difficult situation that the speaker is in. Uh, more personification with the eyes that accuse and convict the speaker. So personification and metaphor, I think, are, are the two main devices here. Uh, it's ironic how the speaker says in the first stanza that his home country takes precedence. <laughs> uh, it, it, he's indecisive. He, he can't choose. Even, to the very, even at the very end, he can't make up his mind. That's what I think. He's still split between both countries. But in the in the end, did he choose? Did he choose any any country? <laughs> uh, is Brutus referring to his country as mistress in tenderness in the last line? Right, let me look at the last line. Okay, so we have to take it from the top of the second stanza. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty. He's talking to one of the countries here. The con not his home country, but the country that he, I guess, settled in. Perhaps America. So Brutus is from South Africa, but he, he lived in America for some time. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And I hope that she, my dearest, my other dearest love, so he's talking to, let's say, the new country, country number two, the side chick country. And he's saying that, I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely. So is, he's telling the new country that he hopes that his home country will forgive him for falling in love with the new country. And he's saying not attaching blame so he doesn't want his home country to blame, to blame him too much. Being your mistress, in this case, mistress means uh, it's like master, the female version of master. Being your mistress or match or your match in tenderness. So just as the, the new country is tender, tender meaning he could find refuge and safety in the new country. But he's saying, my homeland is your mistress in tenderness. My homeland is even more tender than you are, or at least just as tender based on or your match. Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? So he's saying that the home country is the new country's mistress in tenderness, meaning the home country is even more tender than the new country. So he's trying to believe that he will be forgiven by the home country. Hmm. All right. L let me try to break down both stanzas. All right. So it is the constant image of your face framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair. The grave attention of your eyes surveying me amid my world of knives. 
that stays with me per perennially accuses and convicts me of heart's treachery. And neither you nor I can plead excuses, for you, you know, can claim no loyalty. So he's telling the second country. So there are two countries in the poem. The home country and country number two. Let's consider it that way. The home country and country number two. The home country would be like the speaker's wife. The other country that he would have, you know, run away to would be like the countries, like would be like the speaker's side chick in the comparison, right? So he's telling this side chick country, he's telling the second country that you cannot expect me to be loyal to you because I have my wife. I have my homeland that I have to be loyal to. So you can't expect that I can just love you alone. I have to love my homeland even more. That's what I get from, um, from stanza one. In stanza two now, he's asking, he, he wants both countries to forgive him for loving the other country. So imagine a man who, he loves two countries, but each country is jealous of the other country. And he wants, he wants everybody to get along. He wants to be forgiven. So he says in stanza two, in stanza two, he's, he's talking to, um, the same side chick country. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty. So he's saying that I, I am guilty. I, I have two loves. I love two countries. I'm guilty of that. But he's begging mitigation, almost like he's begging mercy or a, just as a light sentencing. He doesn't want to be sentenced too harshly by the country. And he says here, for you, my dear accomplice of my heart. So he's saying that this new country is the accomplice. An accomplice is someone who helps out in a crime. The crime that he has committed is falling in love with the new country. But he's saying, you helped me to commit this crime. You forced me to fall in love with you. Why? Because you blackmailed me with your beauty. So imagine your homeland is Jamaica. You love Jamaica, Jamaica, the land of my birth. You go to America and, you know, you start, you start make, um, make big money, you start eat American food, you, you start enjoying the American life, living the American dream. But you start to feel guilty because you feel as if you're betraying your home country. That is how the speaker is feeling. That's how the speaker is feeling. So he's saying, you... This nice country, you kind of lured me in. You pulled me in because you're, you're, you're too nice. You're too beautiful, right? You're too safe. He found safety and, and protection in this country. But then look at the next line. He talks about treason. He fe treason is betraying one's country. So he feels as if, even though he loves this new country, he feels as if he's betraying his old country by loving the new country. So look at what he desires in the last three lines. I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely. Who is she? If he's talking to the new country, she here must be the home country. I hope that my homeland can forgive me for loving you. I hope that she will not attach blame. How can I have this hope? How can I think that my home country can forgive me? Because my home country is very tender. My home country is a tender, loving, kind country. In fact, even though you, my new country, are a lovely, tender, kind country, my home country is basically your master when it, come on, when it, when, when it comes down to kindness. My, my home country is just as kind, if not kinder than you. So the speaker is kind of optimistic that he will be forgiven, that he will be able to return home and you know, have kind of repair the relationship with his home country. All right, let me see what others understand. Did that make any sense to those confused about who this speaker is talking to and what he's saying? The guilt is directed toward the home country to forgive him. 
Yeah, yeah, and the guilt is also directed toward the new country because he, he's saying, you blackmailed me. You offered me this freedom, this safety, this money. So it's basically your fault why I fell in love with you. So it's like a man leaving his wife for a pretty young girl and saying, I blame the pretty young girl for being too pretty and too young. It's her fault. You know, that is the blackmail. I'm seeing some yes, sir. So I, I, I guess I made something clear, even though I think I, I might have not been so clear. Uh, yes, it's one aim. Forgive me if I'm not as clear as I want to be. <laughs> uh, yeah, the speaker feels quite guilty. He's, he's constantly remembering, you know, kind of like, like the treachery here. He's remembering his, his homeland. But he, he wants to love both countries. Just as a person can love their home country and then get used to another country. I, I've been living in Japan for about five years. I love Jamaica. Jamaica is my homeland. But I can't say that I, I don't love Japan. I love Japan as well. So it's, it's a situation where sometimes, you know, as a person who lives abroad, you feel guilty for it. It's, it's almost as if you're, you've, you've abandoned a country. But, you know, Japan blackmailed me. Japan offered me a nice job and a convenient life and good safety. So I can blame Japan and say, it's Japan's fault. Why, why, why I fell in love with Japan? It's not my fault. Japan is to blame. That is what the speaker is doing. He's blaming the new country for the life he was offered. But then he's saying, you know, I think my home country will forgive me because my home country is tender. So I think I can go back to Jamaica. Jamaica will accept me again. Um, my, my, my video lesson on this poem is, is clearer than I'm being now because I'm trying to rush to beat the clock at this point. But... Check out that lesson and you, you, you will see what's going on. How many points are left? Uh, let's, let's see. Oh, we're on 13. We can't make it to 20 tonight. <laughs> but um, I think we, we've, done, we've done a good job on, on at least touching on mo most of the points. So for those of you who haven't, um, as a matter of fact, uh, all right, so here, these are the, the 20, um, the 20 videos from Little Boy Crying up to the last one I did was Theme for English B, all right? So these are the lessons on the poems, the constant image of a face That's a 21 minute lesson. It, it goes into what's going on with these two countries and, and so on. So watch or if necessary re-watch these lessons and you can also look for other lessons on youtube you know but also many of the questions i've gotten today had to do with themes and devices i have one video that talk about the major themes in the devices and one that talks about the major devices what am i saying the major themes in the poems <laughs> And one that talk about the major devices in the poems. So you can check those out as well. No, for tomorrow. Tomorrow I want us to do... Yes, of course, Lakeisha, we're, we're doing paper one on day three. Right? I'm going to show you the, the flyer again. Today, we, we did the poetry Q&A where we just, you know, try to iron out a few, a few details. Tomorrow, we're doing essay writing. And Wednesday, we're doing paper one. So for tomorrow, if you haven't, I want you to watch these videos for tomorrow. The essay writing videos. I have one, two, I have five essay writing videos. This is the most important one. This one will, will talk about the essay outline. The reason why I want you to watch this for tomorrow is I'm not going to be going through the, the essay outline in detail. I will assume that you've already watched this video. So watch this video 
for tomorrow. And also take a look at the sample S's. So what we'll be doing tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be taking you through one more sample essay and I will kind of annotate the essay. Uh, Lakisha would know what I'm talking about. Uh. <laughs> I will annotate the essay and show you the different parts of the essay. And after that, you guys will actually write two essays. You're going to write essays from, uh, let me see what essays. Uh, oh, wait a minute. You're going to be writing essays from June 2021. So tomorrow, I'm going to be taking you guys through, I think, these two essays. Think, I think these two essays. All right. I have a couple of um, past papers of paper two. We're going to be looking at those tomorrow. So tomorrow we are going to be writing essays for two to three hours. So please be ready. Be ready for that. Be ready for that. It's going to be a, a working day. A working day. Well, you guys, thanks so much for coming out. I'm going to post the links to the Zoom meetings that some of you guys missed. I'm going to post the link in the comment section for this video so you can check that out. Guys, all right, just before we go, uh, one more time, let me just recap what we're going to be doing for the next two days. So today, Monday the 9th, Poetry Q&A. Tomorrow, we're doing the SM Marathon, right? We're going to start same time, same place. And uh, Wednesday, we're going to be doing, I have three past papers. Um, I might get more, but I'm not sure if we can do more than three in one session because each past paper is going to take maybe an hour and a half. So that's what we're going to be doing. That's what we're going to be doing. So we're going to start at the same time. 8 a.m. Jamaica time. Guys, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining from wherever you have joined from. I will be, so check the comment section. Check the description box. Sorry, I'm sleepy. Check the description box in a, in a couple of minutes or maybe in a couple of hours for the links. Also, watch those essay writing videos in preparation for tomorrow. Yes, we didn't make it through all, all of the points, but I think we did 13 points. So for the other points that we didn't do, use the other resources. And also, guys, let me tell you. For the points that we didn't cover today, or if you even have additional questions, you can ask questions on the, the, the lesson videos using the comment section. So you can just comment a question and I'll get back to it. I respond to every comment all the time. I always respond. So if you watch, for example, um, it is the constant image of your face. If you watch my video and something sounds confusing, just tell me what sounds confusing. Tell me what a question is. Tell me which point I missed and I will address it. All right, so hopefully you guys will make it here tomorrow. Are you guys on study break? I guess you're on study break because you're here. I guess you're on study break. All right. Anyway, guys, peace out. It's 1.10 a.m. for me. For you guys, it might be 10 or 11. So, uh, yes, you're, you're, you're certainly welcome, guys. It's my pleasure. So I'm going to sign off in one minute and I'll see you guys tomorrow to write some essays. It's noon. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. Peace out. Um, you can tell, tell your classmates to join if you have English B classmates who, who didn't show up today. Yeah, the more the merrier. And by the way, for those who have not yet subscribed to the channel, come on. What are you waiting for? 
what, what are you doing? Anyway, guys, tomorrow I'm going to catch some Z's now. Yes, people, like the video as well. Thank you, Lakeisha. <laughs> All right, guys, see you, see you, see you tomorrow. Same time, same place.